closing the critical period might actually be neuroprotective. Uh, if we uh, remove the brakes on the plasticity, then um, yes, there is a moment for rewiring, but too much of a good thing could lead to um, disruption or degeneration. I'm John Fox, Director of the Del Monte Institute for Neuroscience at the University of Rochester, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Neuroscience Perspectives. I'm really excited to introduce to you today my guest, Dr. Takawa Henge. Dr. Henge is a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School at Boston Children's Hospital and professor of molecular and cellular biology at Harvard's Center for Brain Science. He leads the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, Silvio Conti Center on Mental Health Research at Harvard, and the International Research Center for Neurointelligence. He has received a plethora of honors, including the NIH Director's Pioneer Award and the Mort Sackler MD Prize for Distinguished Achievement in Developmental Psychobiology. His research examines how early life experience shapes brain function, critical periods of brain development, and whether plasticity can be opened or targeted to treat neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative diseases. So thank you for joining us, and I'm just absolutely delighted to have you here, Takawa, uh, to have a chat here in Neuroscience Perspectives. Welcome to, welcome to Rochester. Thank you for having me. I know you had a late flight in, so hmm. uh, we really appreciate you uh, getting, getting here and, uh, and joining us. Uh, let's get let's get started with your research. I, w what we we're going to definitely want to do is mm -hmm. come back and, and understand your journey into science. But let, let's talk a little bit about critical periods. Mm -hmm. uh, I think actually, you know, probably everybody on the planet who's read a basic science book mm -hmm. knows about critical periods, mm -hmm. and and probably baked into their thinking is you know there's a very small window of time during neurodevelopment when these periods open up mm -hmm. and they close. And if you haven't learned what you need to learn in those periods of time, the game is up. Mm -hmm disabuse us of that notion. <laughs> right. Well, throughout human history, we've appreciated the importance of early childhood and infancy in shaping our identities. And this uh, taps into some fundamental biology. From mouse to human, we see that um, brain functions are shaped uh, early in life and that um, many of them are kind of locked in. The degree to which that's true in terms of reversibility is something that's being actively researched now. Um, and it's the advent of modern neurobiological techniques that allow us to understand what opens these windows, determines their duration, and ultimately might close them or not. And uh, by following those paths, we can try to understand whether they really are um, closed for good. Right. And is, so is the timing of these windows of opportunity to learn specific functions. It's, it's stereotyped across individuals. Is it driven by the environment? What, what's turning on and off these windows? Well, it's the classic gene-environment interaction question. And in fact, uh, we know that there are many uh, cellular components that contribute to the timing mechanism now. And those are, in fact, sensitive to environment. So the answer is, of course, both are involved. And in, in certain extreme cases, mental illness, uh, you might see this play out in a very dramatic way as a shift in timing. Right. And, and are these developmental windows, these critical periods, they're in utero as well mm -hmm. as uh, uh, after the birth, is that? That's right. So some systems, like the auditory system, is coming online before birth. And um, there's a, a, a first um, important notion that uh, critical periods are staggered and not happening synchronously across brain modalities. So different functions coming online over time. And maybe the, the sense is rolling out in a, in a pseudo-sequential form? Or? That's right. So there's a rough sense of hierarchy that uh, primary sensory areas, the first filters to the outside world, seem to be shaped earlier than higher cognitive functions. But this is a very rough approximation. Um, the important notion is that there's not one critical period. There are multiple critical periods. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and then your research really looks at the sort of the molecular biology and, this, and the physiology, neurophysiology mm -hmm. of that. And 
Uh, are there insights that you, you know, if you were sort of to say, like, what are my top three things that I know about these, mm-hmm. this plasticity? Mm-hmm. What is plasticity and what are, what are those things that, that really give rise to the ability to learn? Right. Well, plasticity, of course, is the uh, ability to adapt to change. And our brain is a plastic machine. That's its job. Um, but we know that uh, this degree of plasticity changes dynamically across the lifespan. And so um, critical periods or sensitive periods arise because early life experiences are particularly potent in shaping the brain. And um, the experimental work is trying to understand why that is. You know, a reasonable question would be, you know, if this plasticity is so great for learning, why on earth do we shut it down at all? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we stay that way throughout the duration of a lifetime? Right. That is a great question. And I think... um, it's always uh, tempting to think more is better. But as we learn uh, how these windows come about, and there are some surprises that uh, we've come across along the way, we understand better why it's important to dial down and stabilize circuitry. And in fact, we spend most of our life in this more stable uh, processing mode. Um, I guess there are two insights I could elaborate on. Um, Just computationally speaking, it wouldn't make sense to rewire uh, with every possible experience. And in fact, that might be a condition akin to certain mental illnesses where uh, mechanisms of closing critical periods are not fully active. Um, And then from... Could you you give... Sorry to interrupt, but could you give us an example of that? I mean, that's a fascinating notion that, that it's... It's plasticity run awry that might Mm -hmm. give rise to a mental illness. Right. So um, at the cellular level, plasticity is ultimately about rewiring connections. And uh, one example of that is the pruning of dendritic spines on the Mm -hmm. predominant excitatory neurons in the cortex, for example. And in mental illnesses like schizophrenia, a hallmark signature is excessive pruning. And so this could be because critical periods have not fully closed and excessive uh, uh, remodeling has been ongoing. And in fact, that's how we got interested in the mental illness angle of critical periods. As we started to unearth um, the different mechanisms that are involved in closure, um, they were being linked uh, separately in GWAS studies to schizophrenia, for example. So in the big genome-wide association studies, the genes responsible for this plasticity are mm-hmm. popping up as, as candidates in, in, in this terrible disease. That's right. And I'd say that's very interesting, right? So, so which would also give some explanation, which I think fascinates people to like, you know, why does schizophrenia emerge mm-hmm. in the late teens and the early 20s, mm-hmm. uh, rather than, you know, it, it's got that peculiar time course to it. And of course, this would provide an explanation for that. Right. As well as the fact that these windows happen at different times in different brain regions. And so the kind of executive functions that are compromised in schizophrenia related to prefrontal brain function are naturally where these windows are closing last. Right, right. It gives me two two questions. So, um, you know, I think uh, people, again, would be aware now that we now know that some of this uh, development of brain architecture, particularly in the prefrontal lobes, continues right into the 20s. Mm-hmm. So, that, so, so some of these critical periods are really late in life, you know, not, not, not an infancy mm-hmm. business. Is that the case? Or? That's right. And in fact, in the human, in some brain, higher order brain areas, they may never really close. And that's the second insight I was alluding to. At a cellular level, the genes that are um, related to critical period closure seem to be um, surprisingly uh, break-like factors that inhibit physically um, or functionally, the plastic process, which would mean that um, critical period closure is an active process, not the traditional thinking that plasticity fades away with age. That's the phenomenology, but it's actually not because of the loss of plasticity so much as the active prevention of plasticity. And um, it suggests that if you look at brain regions that have evolved in humans that are not present in mice, for example, um, and tend to stay plastic longer, uh, sure enough, we find fewer of these break-like factors there, consistent with the idea that uh, human intelligence has benefited from adding areas that don't close this plastic window. Very good. Very, that's mm-hmm. absolutely fascinating. So now, of course, that brings us mm-hmm. to can you get in there and turn on and off these switches? There'd mm-hmm. be an obvious benefit. 
I suppose, um, you know, if you think about things like stroke or mm -hmm. that where people lose a function mm -hmm. and they don't have the plasticity to remap, to, to get bring brain circuits on to, to compensate, mm -hmm. is there, there's opportunity there, right? And that's Absolutely. a big piece of what you do. Yes. So the, the kind of science fiction like uh, notion of reopening or rejuvenating plasticity in the adult brain has uh, a very powerful therapeutic implication for recovery from brain injury, uh, stroke in adulthood. Of course, um, as you've mentioned, we have to do this in a very measured, careful way because evolution has turned on these brakes for a reason, and we can talk more about that. Right. But um, the, the goal uh, with our work at, at Children's Hospital and other uh, clinically relevant um, venues is exactly this. Can we leverage critical period biology to recover brain function? And would, would a, an aspect of that be spatially specific targeting and turning on and off circuits? I mean, there, I mean, there's the obvious thing to do something right. systemic and you open up mm -hmm. the whole brain and this may be not <laughs> where you want to go. Right. So um, now that we know that um, critical periods happen sequentially in a well-orchestrated manner, thanks to triggers and breaks that open and close these windows, um, you could imagine how damaging it would be to reopen the whole brain at once. Right. Um, but there are probably some uh, safe, uh, fail-safe mechanisms there as well. And so it's not that we are making the brain plastic so much as opening a gate that's right. permissive for training to change in a modality-specific way. Amazing. Absolutely yeah. astounding. Takawa, you know, uh, you were talking about this business of, um, you know, the closing of, of critical periods and, you know, at a relatively high level. What Can we talk a little bit at more granular level about some of the molecular biology and some insights that you might have there? Yes, yeah, sure. I think um, there have been two uh, very... Um, surprising discoveries in the study of critical periods. Um, one is that um, they are very uh, sensitive to the development of inhibitory neurons and that the timing of these windows can be movable uh, depending on when these inhibitory, particular class of inhibitory cell matures. It's surprising because um, plasticity is often studied at excitatory connections onto excitatory neurons, which are far more abundant. Um, but the inhibitory cells seem to drive the bus, and they are of a particular type. They are fast spiking cells. They use a lot of energy and so are vulnerable to oxidative stress, which they generate. And in fact, uh, some of the closure mechanisms are related to dampening this oxidative stress. And so um, closing the critical period might actually be neuroprotective. And that uh, if we uh, remove the brakes on the plasticity, then um, yes, there is a moment for rewiring, but too much of a good thing could lead to um, right. disruption or degeneration. And a change in this excitatory inhibitory balance, which is a big piece of our, our important right. theory in, in neurodegenerative disorders. And that's how we got into autism, in fact. Is so that right? discovering that inhibition was pivotal and that this balance is what we should be looking at, not just right. LTP of excitatory connections, gotcha. um, has uh, really made uh, headway into autism research. Yes. I first came to know about your work because you were working on mouse models of autism. Mm -hmm. and I wanted to uh, I want to get a little bit controversial because, mm -hmm. because uh, I think, you know, there's, there are a lot of folks out there who say, how on earth is it possible mm -hmm. to model a disease as complex as autism, mm -hmm. where the symptoms we think about are social communications mm -hmm. and, you know, repetitive behaviors and stuff, this sort of defining symptom clusters. Mm -hmm. how, how can you possibly be studying that in the mouse? Are you willing to... to Give us, a, give us a little tutorial on oh, that. Oh, certainly, yes. Um, we would never be so bold as to claim a mouse has autism, but they are a very powerful living test tube of what happens to a complex circuit when a gene implicated in autism is disrupted. Right. And so that's how we treat the, the model system said this um, with uh, modern machine learning approaches and more sophisticated analyses of behavior and being able to think more like a mouse, we might be able to extract a, a complex phenotype even in these animals. So I think these two uh, thought processes are running in parallel, right. but uh, we've learned quite a bit about how local circuits and synapses develop, um, taking the approach that genes linked to human autism can be probed in mice. Fantastic. Okay, well, that's crystal clear. Mm -hmm. Very well put, I must say. If we can, can we 
dial the clock back. And, and uh, you know, we, we had a little chat before and I, I got to, to hear a little bit about, mm-hmm. you know, your trajectory. Uh, you weren't born on these shores. So no. Can we go back to the beginning, the genesis of mm-hmm. uh, Takawa Hench and <laughs> what, what got you to where you're at, you know, at Harvard, one of the great institutions on the planet studying autism and mouse models. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, but where were you born? And, sure. And how did that impact your development. Right. Well, as you can guess from my name, um, I'm half Japanese, half German. And um, my father uh, met my mother in Tokyo. And um, he was an engineer, computer scientist um, back in the day. And um, he was uh, sent to Japan by IBM (laughs) to uh, design the first uh, Chinese character keyboards. And as you can imagine, um, there are thousands of Chinese characters. To encode all of that in keyboards was uh, quite a challenge. And he came up with a coding scheme, a double byte character set, to encode um, the the characters, even though he didn't speak a word of Japanese, uh, taking a very German engineering approach. Um, and that's still used today in encoding these uh, characters on keyboards. Oh, extraordinary. And um, during that time, um, he met my mother. It was around the time of the first Tokyo Olympic Games. And um, uh, I was raised in a multilingual environment. Um, they took it upon themselves to speak only their native language with me. And uh, then we moved to New York. Um, my father was moved to IBM. Well, let me jump in. Yeah. So, so your father was learning Japanese at this point? Or? Yes, yes, of course. Um, right. Given the job he was yeah, asked course, to do. Yeah. Um, and uh, my mother was studying German, actually, as it turned out. And so they, they happened to uh, I see, I see. meet uh, in that way. And, um, and then uh, his job took him to New York, and the whole family moved um, to the United States when I was three. So my... Um, but at three years of age, your bilingual mm. Japanese, or at least a proto-bilingual Japanese-German speaker, you haven't heard a word of English at this Not point. Not a word of English, that's right. And, um, and then English came in. Um, But fortunately for me, everything was compartmentalized. So English was friends and outside the house. Um, And I grew up in that way. I I also attended a Japanese school in New York uh, um, in parallel to the American school. And so I I was able to keep the the languages separate in that way. And that's what drew my interest to the brain. And that goes to extraordinary plasticity i mean I, I think you know this is one of the things of, of course about being in america and a painting in broad strokes but a, a great number of people in america grow up in a monolingual environment mm-hmm. and just the idea that you can pack three entire <laughs> languages simultaneously into a child's brain i mean mm-hmm. the plasticity must be extraordinary yes it was surprising to me actually that um you know in school we learn a second language and so I took French. Oh, so just, and, yeah. just for good measure, and, you decided to do number four. <laughs> and um, the French class uh, really opened my eyes um, that most other kids were not growing up in a trilingual <laughs> environment. Yeah. And um, I'm really struggling with it. Yeah, learning French uh, was somehow easier because I guess I was used to the idea of multiple representations for the same objects. Right, right. Um, and so that's when I, I started to develop this fascination with how early life experience can change uh, brain function. Right, right, yeah. right. Amazing. Any other languages that we need to know about? <laughs> well, my wife is Italian. Oh, so goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> working on that. You're working on that too. I'm finding it easy or? <laughs> yes, it's con- more confusing because of the French. Yeah. Um, and so it's a latecomer. And um, of course, uh, different words pop in at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually in the process of trying to learn a little bit of Spanish. Um, but gr- gr- growing up in Ireland, where we have Irish and mm-hmm. English, uh, the fact that there's that that facility is there as well, mm-hmm. I think it make, makes it a little bit easier to to uh, catch on to a new language. Right. Yeah. And so, so that 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 is actually formed this business of being multilingual mm-hmm. uh, a polyglot mm-hmm. has uh, really shaped your thinking in, in, a, in a lot of ways very much so it, it shaped uh, my journey into uh, neuroscience um, and also what how i uh, traversed the trajectory um, where i sought out uh, training right right tell us about that so mm-hmm. so you, so you uh, uh, moved to long island right mm-hmm. and then you moved to westchester county to tarrytown i believe mm-hmm. yes and that's where you did your schooling that's high right. school and all that mm-hmm. and then college from there yes i went to harvard and um, i 
was very gung-ho on uh, the first wave, I'm dating myself now, of AI, really, um, right. um, where expert systems, as they were called in the day, um, were achieving great things. So and not neuroscience in the beginning. You were thinking, you, was this right. because of your dad's engineering Probably, background? Probably, yeah. most likely. Yeah. Yes, I, the summer before college, I, I worked at uh, IBM Watson Laboratories in a natural language right. processing Which is lab. right there, right, That's in right. Lower Westchester. Yeah, yeah in uh, Yorktown Heights. That's, That's right. right, yeah. 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 And so um, with that enthusiasm, I arrived at Harvard thinking computer science will solve everything. And then, of course, uh, realizing that we know precious little about the brain. Um, at the time, it was shortly after uh, Hubel and Wiesel had won the Nobel Prize for understanding the fundamental organization of the visual cortex right. and critical periods. And so um, I switched more into neurobiology at that point. And as an undergraduate. As an undergraduate. I see, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you were, I mean, you were really in a hotbed of, of scientific discovery <laughs> in the neurosciences at that point at Harvard. Yeah, so much, so much going on. And yeah. um, I kind of worked my way up the neuraxis. Um, I did my undergraduate thesis with Alan Hobson, uh, the late Alan Hobson, yeah. in, in sleep research. And um, from there, uh, took a fellowship to Masao Ito's lab at the University of Tokyo. He's, of course, the godfather of the cerebellum yeah, and yeah. plasticity in the cerebellar cortex. And then um, had a Fulbright year with Wolf Singer in the Max Planck in Frankfurt and ended up with Michael Stryker at UCSF um, to really get to work on critical period mechanisms. Wow, you've really collected uh, the institutions <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and some extraordinarily prominent mentors. I've yeah. been very fortunate, yes. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. And, and going back to Tokyo, was that yeah. uh, a specific choice based on being, you know, being Japanese, of Japanese origin and that? Oh yes, after college and having grown up in the States, I, I really wanted to follow my roots and yeah. spend some time in Japan and Germany. Outstanding, outstanding. We wouldn't be complete here without getting back to uh, your original motivation, which was around computer science and AI. And this, this has come full circle now, right, with the, the interface. I mean, we're in the AI revolution at the moment. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts about the role of AI in the neurosciences as we, as we speak, as we're sitting here. Yes, isn't this fascinating? So it really has come full circle. Um, but now we have uh, several decades of neurobiological understanding behind it as well. The current uh, excitement about AI is uh, loosely modeled on brain structure in terms of deep neural networks. And with the brute force power of computing that's available, amazing things are happening. And uh, everyone is familiar with GPTs and so forth. Um, but I think the question still remains, why is it seemingly effortless for a child with very little exposure to learn how to speak one or multiple languages or learn a variety of skills um, in ways that um, are not yet possible with uh, current AI? And so the motivation uh, behind our work now is to understand principles of brain development, which might um, uh, bring the AI a little closer to the way humans acquire their knowledge or intelligent behaviors. Um, but at the same time, honoring the fact that the world has changed mm -hmm. and that uh, humans will need to coexist with the AI and um, uh, uh, rely on it in ways that were not possible even a year and a half ago. So um, the alignment problem of human and artificial intelligence and having AIs that understand the motivations of humans when they're uh, interacting with them is extremely important. Right, right. Yeah. And on, to, on that front, I mean, do you think uh, that AI, you know, watching AIs develop human-like skills mm -hmm. is a pathway to understanding disease, for example? Is that a... Yes, I think so. So uh, from a conceptual point of view, um, intelligent behavior can exist in a vacuum or a void like AI might in the virtual space. But at the same time, uh, it's a, a good reminder that the brain exists in a body and um, it's bringing our kind of reductionist approach back out to consider the brain as um, a homeostatic organ within 
an individual mm -hmm. whose job is to move and adapt to environments and things that AI doesn't necessarily need to worry about. Right. And so our brain has evolved to deal with a particular set of constraints, namely existing within a body, right. which AI doesn't. And this might be uh, one major difference in, in the way these two forms of intelligence are uh, being developed. Right. Yeah. But we have the ability to embody an AI, right, in robot, that's robotics right. and, and so on. That's right. Yeah. So that's part of um, uh, the work we do with some of our colleagues in Japan, um, developmental robotics, as it's called, um, to uh, have actual physical robots that are then uh, programmed with uh, models of the developing brain to test our understanding of how brain development works, but also as tools for interacting with autistic children, for example, right. Right. who often um, uh, might prefer to interact with a robot rather than uh, another human. Embodied human, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, it's absolutely uh, <laughs> fascinating. D um, you know, when people worry about the sort of apocalyptic <laughs> things, I mean, does the, the, do you have any worries about that? AI, you know, jumping the shark? <laughs> of course, um, it is a concern and uh, ethics and uh, the proper use of um, AI and how it's um, advanced n needs to really catch up quickly now um, to make sure that guidelines are in place. Right, that's right, for right. sure. So it's in it, it's yeah. in our own control, right? You've had a you know an extraordinary career. I mean, you really really have. And and uh, you know, looking back on on the things that happened and the people that you met, mm -hmm. do you, has it given you a sense for um, the path to success? And, and, you know, if you were to take that and, and turn it into advice for a youngster today, mm. you have some pearls of wisdom. We always <laughs> ask this question. Right. You know. Yes, well, um, the world is changing dramatically, so I feel like I'm a bit dated already. <laughs> um, serendipity has been a big part of this. Um, I started my lab uh, uh, out of graduate school. Uh, from UCSF went back to Japan. It was not something that I had imagined doing, um, but um, they were launching a new institute, the Riken Brain Science Institute. Yeah. And the goal was to create something more Western, um, not the traditional hierarchical system of Japanese university. And I thought, well, who am I? I'm just starting out, you know. And um, I had a lot of interesting ideas, I thought, uh, for the research, but uh, was just uh, untested. Right. But I felt that I could bring um, the kind of Western infrastructure or ecosystem to a new institution. And uh, in that way, I felt like I could contribute right away in addition to eventually science. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was a very, very lucky break. Um, I was, of course, anxious <laughs> about doing that, but excited at the same time. Um, it was an institution that had no tenure. Um, it was on a five-year review cycle, right, right. and um, the challenge was there, um, also moving far from the familiar. Um, but um, chances come around very rarely, and so, I think my advice would be if a young person had an opportunity, um, they shouldn't uh, be afraid. Yeah. And um, seize should, the day. Seize the day. Right. Yeah. The, you know, you said something very interesting there about the business of bringing sort of a Western model, I assume, you mean like an, an American model yes. to science. Is, is, there, is there something about that that makes it intrinsically better or uh, at getting the work done, do you mm -hmm. think? Better in the sense that um, uh, young people are brimming with ideas. Um, and uh, in a hierarchical system like the traditional Japanese university system. Right. Um, and much of Europe. And much of Europe. Yeah. Gaining the independence to follow your own ideas takes years of patience yeah. and uh, moving up the hierarchy. Um, the U.S. system uh, empowers uh, assistant professors to be right. independent with all the risk that comes along with that, of course, but also the independence um, to follow right. your right. dream. Yeah. So strip, stripping away the politics a little bit and, mm -hmm. and maybe is there, is there a more business model to it, do you think? Is that part of it? or 
business model to the the American way um, is very successful for advancing science. Mm -hmm. The freshest, brightest minds are given the opportunity right, right away. Um, what's more difficult is the long vision. So I've noticed in Europe and certainly in Japan, grants are designed around long-term vision. And right. if you're studying something like Alzheimer's disease, which takes years to manifest, um, it's very hard to imagine uh, doing a holistic study um, with short three, five-year yeah. yeah. grant cycles. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So short, sharp kind mm -hmm. of bolus of money for a youngster to get some ideas going, but the bigger the bigger, the wicked problems mm -hmm. are, are, are a little less tangible with that model. Right. Well, that's really, really interesting. And thank you for those, those <laughs> exceptional insights. Takao, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And uh, uh, thanks for joining us on Neuroscience Perspectives. Thank you for having me.